he's gone away from God and so on. And I think, uh, I think a lot of people, not just the United States of America, but all over the world, people are not living according to God's principles. I mean, that's just a fact. Majority of the people are living according to their own rules of behavior and, to their, and, and according to their own lifestyle choices, you know, which sometimes are not in accordance with God's will. The question that, uh, that uh, has been raised last week is about America, you know, and the uh, uh, first question that I'm asking here today is, uh, is America modern Israel? In other words, has God made a covenant with America just in the same way that he did with the ancient Israel? As you know, there was a time the Bible teaches us, we read it very early in the scriptures, that, uh, <coughs> that uh, God came to Abraham and he made a covenant with him and his descendants, and he told Abraham that he was going to give them the Palestinian land, the land of Canaan. This is the land today where the Palestinians and Israelis live together on that same plot of land. So God promised that to Abraham. And as you know, in the Seventh-day Adventist tradition, we teach that all of the promises are conditional. And that means pretty much the same thing that you do with your kids when you say, uh, if you uh, finish your homework, then I'll take you to, to the movies. Or if you, you know, get good grades this year in school, I'm going to buy you a car or a bicycle, right? So, they, so we believe that in, the, in those kinds of promises, and we believe that God made these promises to Israel uh, conditionally. If you obey my laws and my commandments, then I will bless you. And the God said many times, both Old Testament and in the, in the New Jesus and the apostles alluded to this, that if you obey, God is going to bless you and he is going to keep the trouble away from you. On the other hand, if you're disobedient, then God is going to take away his protection from your land, from your country, from your people, from your family, and you're going to be in trouble. So, you know, the question is, today a lot of people are saying, America has broken their covenant with God. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I'm going to say it, there is no time in American history when God came to George Washington and said, I'm going to make a covenant with you and your people. It just never happened, you know. I mean, yes, we are a Christian country. Yes, most of the people that came to this land from Europe originally, you know, they came here as Christians. But there was never a moment in the American history or in the history of any other nation since the time of Israel and Abraham that God went to anybody else and said, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and I'm going to do this and this and this, and then if you disobey, I'm going to punish you. So, you know, that's, that's just a fact of life. Did God make a covenant with America? We don't have a record of that. We don't have a history of that. It just didn't happen, you know. Was, uh, God, well, did God uh, bless the United States of America? I think he did. I think God blessed this country. Um, and I think God wants to bless a lot of countries. But at the same time, uh, I believe that the idea of these kingdoms and nationalities and nations, that God is going to take special care of them, I think that era, that time is gone. I believe that now you are saved individually, whether you're a Jew or an Arab or an American, and there is only one gospel, there is only one salvation, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not on the national level, not as the United States of America, not as Israel, not as Palestine, but as an individual. Washington, which was the president of the United States of America, obviously the first one, the founder. You know, I looked up a little bit about him, and I looked up a little bit about the founders of this country. And believe it or not, a lot of them were not very much religious. As a matter of fact, many of them were Masons and uh, had all kinds of beliefs in their, in their uh, head, you know. Washington uh, did believe in providence. He believed that there was a divinity inter intervening in worldly affairs, and this divinity seemed to be on the side of the new republic. In other words, he believed that this divinity, this divine presence, was protecting this new republic. We know that Washington wrote many times of the value of Christianity as a guiding influence on the new republic citizens, However, he was equally clear that the character-building nature of religious institution was not exclusive to Christianity. In other words, you could also be a Jewish, for example, and your character could be built through participating and practicing that particular faith. 
Uh, Washington was at least a cultural Christian, but we have no evidence that he was what we would call today born-again Christian. And we can say that about a lot of these founders of the United States. They were kind of good people, believed in some kind of divinity, but they were not necessarily born-again Christians. Separation of state and church was um, a founding principle of the United States of America, you know. Rhode Island was the first state that enacted these kinds of laws, you know, that, where they decided to keep the church outside of the government and to keep the government outside of the church. And one of the reasons was uh, when the Americans came to America, when the early European settlers came to the United States, majority of them, a large majority of them, came here under duress. They did not come here because they just wanted to go see some new land. You know, to travel from Europe to the United States in the, in the 16th century, 16th and 17th century, was extremely treacherous. There was no, um, you couldn't be confident that you were ever going to make it to this land. Many people died on that voyage, you know, so people did not take that voyage lightly. And they did not just say, oh, I want to go to the United States because of an adventure. A majority of them left because they were under religious persecution, mostly from the Catholic Church in, in the Europe. And that's why in the United States of America you have a strong, very strong anti-Catholic sentiment all the way until uh, 1960s, you know. And uh, the Catholic religion was uh, looked upon as something that was bad. Pope was looked at somebody who was a bad person, who was you know, taking away our religious liberties and so on. So when the pilgrims came to this country, yes, they were Christian. Yes, they practiced Christianity, but they were very wor worried about uh, government and church becoming so entangled that the church was going to dictate to the government what kind of laws to pass and so on. So the First Amendment says, First Amendment, very important amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for the redress of grievances. In other words, Congress shall not make any laws respecting an establishment of religion. And then, it's, and then we have the First Amendment Establishment Clause, which prohibits the government from making any law respecting an establishment of religion. This clause not only forbids the government from establishing an official religion, this is very important, but also prohibits government actions that unduly favor one religion over another. It also prohibits the government from unduly preferring uh, religion over non-religion or religion over religion. In other words, government is supposed to stay outside of the religion. Seventh-day Adventists, we have a long history of supporting uh, uh, freedom of religion and liberty and Christian liberty, you know, where you can choose how you want to worship. And we have opposed, our church has opposed church and state entanglement and church getting into the government. We have opposed that from the, from the day of our foundation. Why? Not because we don't like uh, Baptists or because we don't like Evangelicals, you know, but because we are worried that any time one religion becomes dominant over everybody else, that they start per persecuting everybody else. And I believe that, you know, I'm going to say this, I believe that even if the Seventh-day Adventists were in the power, I think we would make life miserable for certain folks. You know, because... Why? Why? Let's just talk about that for a second. Why do religious people do this when they come into power? It's very simple. We believe that what we believe came from where? Came from God. If it came from God, then it must be good for everybody. Not just for us, right? So say you get Ben Carson in there and he starts... He becomes the president, and all of a sudden, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in charge of all of the other religions in the United States of America. What could happen? You know, no more smoking on church property, dress codes. Does everybody become a vegetarian? Does everybody have to go to church on Sabbath? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just fantasizing here right now. 
But the fact is that throughout the history, any time the church got the, got the power of the government, they persecuted everybody else who did not agree with them. That's the fact of life. And that's why in this church we have always opposed uh, and we have always supported the separation of state and church. To this day, okay, uh, why is separation of state and religion important today? And now we're getting to this stuff, what's going on in the world today. In the Seventh-day Adventist church, we believe, for those of you who are here maybe for the first time or have never heard this, you know, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we teach that at the end times, before Jesus comes, that the church and state will unite. That the government will unite with the religious institutions of this world. And that's why in this church we have also opposed the unification of the different churches. As you know, the Catholic Church, uh, the Orthodox Church, a lot of Protestants, you know, they're all talking about let's all unite under one tent, under one banner, you know. I mean, we can still have uh, minor differences, but let's all unite, you know. We believe that the time is coming in this world when the church and state will unite and they will pass laws that are oppressive to minority Christians such as ourselves. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We go to church on Saturday. You know, and as a, as a result of that, we have seen persecution against Seventh-day Adventists all over the world in many countries. And let me tell you something. The most persecution we receive is from other, other Christian religions. In the former communist country of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, all of that Eastern Bloc, you know, uh, in, the, in those countries, when the communists were in power, they basically treated all religions the same equally, and we all had the same rights. When the communism fell, and all of a sudden the Catholic Church became dominant church in Poland, the Orthodox Church became a dominant church in Russia, and Serbia, and many other countries, those churches began perse uh, persecution of the Seventh-day Adventists, persecution of the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Baptists, anybody else that was, not, that was in the minority. So as Christians, uh, we believe that the separation of church and state is extremely important, yet at the same time we, re we realize that it's going to happen. One of these days, it's going to happen. Now, are you going to be ready for, for that time? The Bible describes the time of trouble in Mark chapter 13, and I'm going to read that text. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. When the Roman Empire persecuted Christians, they persecuted them under the, under the guise, under the, the, the excuse of the Christians are a threat to our way of living. They are a threat to our existence. They are a national security issue. That was, that's why so many Christians and Jews were killed at those times, because that's how they frame it. They framed it. So, for example, today, if, if all of a sudden you have, and I'm going to talk about that here in a few minutes, you know, if you have a major World War III, and a power such as a religious power, such as a Pope and uh, President Obama and President Putin, you know, they all get together and they say, look, we have to avoid this. We got to do something to stop this slaughter that's going to happen on this planet. What do we do? Well, let's all get back into churches, you know. And then uh, all of a sudden you have this small sect, so to speak, you know, Seventh-day Adventist who says, well, we don't want to go along with that. You guys go ahead and do it, but we don't want to do it. We want to do our own thing. Well, all of a sudden, next thing you know, you are labeled as a threat to the national security. You are labeled as a threat to, to the way of life. You are labeled as a threat to the survival of the, of the world. So what do you do with the threats? You exterminate it. You get rid of it. And that's why the Bible says that the time of trouble is going to be of such a great... Uh, uh, great uh, prominence that, that nobody is going to be able to survive unless God protected them. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, you know, the, the, the series is titled The Greatest Deception. 
And they say, look, here is the Christ. Look, there he is. Do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. It says, be on guard. Well, how do, you, how do you stay on guard? You stay on guard by knowing what we are talking about. You stay on guard by understanding the scriptures. You stay on guard by understanding the prophecy. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Just a few verses later in the Bible, it says, not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard and be awake, for you do not know when the time will come. So th this is the description of what's going on uh, in the last days. That's the prediction. That's what Jesus said was going to happen. The time of trouble such as never was. So, when is it going to be? As we just read in this text, it says the time nobody knows. So what, what it is that we do know today. You know, <clears throat> and, I, and I'm going to be pretty blunt today about what I think is going on. Point number one, and maybe you have seen this in the news, I believe that Israel, the government of Israel, actually, not necessarily all of the people, but I believe that the, you know, that the government of Israel is preparing to take over the Dome of the Rock. And you know what the Dome of the Rock is, right? The Dome of the Rock is the, is the, is the Muslim mosque. It is the third holiest place in all of Islam. And it is in the middle, in the smack middle of Jerusalem. It is on a spot where Jewish people believe that the temple used to exist. See, right there, that's how it looks today. And they believe that the temple, Jewish temple, was right there on this path. So this is a holy place for both Jews and for both the Muslims. Muslims believe that Muhammad, their prophet, ascended into heaven from this place. They will kill for this place. They will strap a bomb to themselves and go and just kill everybody for this place. And the Jewish Orthodox people, same thing. Because this is their holiest place. This is, if they can knock this thing down, they can build a temple. If they can build a temple and start sacrificing again, you know what happens next according to their tradition? The Messiah comes. Not Jesus. You know, we, when we say Messiah, we're thinking Jesus. Not Jesus. They don't believe necessarily that Jesus is the Messiah. So, you know, do I blame either one of these people for what they believe? Not really. I think Jewish people believe what they believe. You can take away from them their Old Testament. You can take away from them their Talmud. You can take away from them their rabbinical teachings. You can take away from them their tradition. That's what they believe. They believe that the Messiah is coming. And they believe that they need to, that God gave them that land back at the time of Abraham and that nobody else is supposed to be living on that land. They believe that. Honestly, earnestly, genuinely. It's not because they hate these people. They deeply believe that particular interpretation of the Old Testament that this is their land and they need to be there and their temple needs to be there and the, when the Messiah comes, he is going to make the nation of Israel great again. And there are a lot of Christians, especially in the United States of America, who believe the same thing. And the reason why Christians believe in the same thing is because Christians are thinking, you know, uh, along the line of rapture. And Christians say, when Jesus, when the rapture happens, all of the Christians are going to go up in heaven. All of the Jews are going to get to have their land of Israel. They're going to get to rebuild their temple they are going to get to enjoy this earth for a thousand years. And then at the end of a thousand years, the Armageddon is going to come. And then, you know, that the, so the whole, you know, you, you have a mess. What we have is a mess. We have Orthodox Jews who believe that this is their land. And they are on a collision course with one and a half billion Muslims. And then in the United States, you have far right evangelicals who believe that it is our duty as Christians to support Israel in taking over this land completely and basically ethnically cleansing it from the Palestinians so that the Messiah could come, so that there could be a rapture, and so that we could have the Armageddon and that Jesus would come 
you know, now Christians, they also believe that when, when the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, when they see that Jesus is the real Messiah, you know, that at that point they are going to convert to Christianity. A mess? I mean, this is such a mess that nobody can untangle this. This is a huge mess. But the fact is, what's going on on the ground? What's going on on the ground? Maybe it's a mess, and people are going to argue about this, and theologians, and Jewish rabbis, and uh, Protestant theologians, and the Pope is going to throw his, uh, his uh, two cents in, you know, and everybody is going to do their own thing. But in the meantime, we have a situation where you could have a World War III that is going to affect this country. Okay? Now, the American hedge fund billionaire, his name is Henry Swieka. He, uh, uh, he is a man who uh, sits on top of a $1.3 billion empire, and he has been funding a temple institute. A, te a temple institute in Israel has a nice building and an office right across the street from this mosque that you have seen, and it is their mission to get a mosque out of the place and to build a Jewish temple on its site. Now, what happens if these people get their way? What happens? You're going to have a war. Because Palestinians, they're saying, you know what? We've been living here just as long as you have. Yes, God called Abraham, but God also made a promise to Ishmael. And Ishmael is now a, a great nation. One and a half billion Arabs living in that area. So we have just as much right to this land as you do. And they're not going to give it up. They're not going to give it up. So where is this, how is this all going to end? Israel at this point, you know, I believe that the nation of Israel, not the nation, but the government of Israel, with President uh, or Prime Minister Netanyahu, is making, uh, is doing everything to make it impossible for Palestinians to live in Israel anymore. That's my personal opinion. Now, people are going to say, Gordon, you're an anti-Semite, you know, you don't like Jews or whatever, you know. And we can, you know, that's, we can, that, that becomes personal, you know. But the fact is, let's just look at the fact. Statistical data sh also show that refugees, Palestinian refugees today, constitute 44.2% of the total Palestinian uh, population in Palestine. So what, Israel, what the government of Israel has been doing since 1948, since the creation of Israel, they have been importing Jewish people into the land of Israel. So, for example, if you want to say that you are a Jew you, he, and you're living here in America, you could go to Israel, you can get circumcised, you can become a Jew, and you can get an apartment or a house or a piece of land. The only problem is that it's probably going to be built on somebody else's land, the Palestinian land. Somebody who's already lived there for the last couple of hundred years, or 2,000 years in many cases, you see. And that's why you have this strife, you know. So the, so the government of Israel has slowly been taking away the Palestinian land and expanding their own territory. Why? Because they have this doctrine that they call the situation on the ground. In other words, if on the ground you have all of these Jewish people living everywhere, you know, then you can't just kick them out one day. So you have this particular situation going on. 3.8 million Palestinians are registered with the United Nations as refugees. One, another 1.5 one million are not registered. 260,000 are internally displaced inside of Israel. And the United Nations just told us uh, about a week or two ago that Gaza, which is the main Palestinian town, is going to become completely uninhabitable by the year 2020, that's in five years. Why? Because they were just uh, attacked last year, uh, between July 7th and August 26th of the last year, uh, 2,000 plus Palestinian people were killed as a result of, the op of, the, of Israel's Operation Protective Edge. And Israel, you know, Netanyahu, he's going to say, well, we had to defend ourselves. They're constantly throwing, lobbing bombs at us. And they are, you know. Palestinians are lobbying bombs at them. And then Israel goes in there. And this particular time, I think uh, Israeli military went a little bit overboard and just leveled that city, you know. 
and uh, killed over 2,000 people, 527 kids, 299 women. Another 400 people are not even identified yet. Um, um, 1,500 children became orphaned during that particular operation. I'm just kind of going quickly th through these slides. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, 11,000 Palestinians were wounded, including over 3,000 children. I mean, you, you start looking at these statistics and you see the level of devastation that you just have not seen since some major wo World War II conflicts, you see. So today, the United Nations estimates that at least 373,000 children are re going to require a long-term psychological uh, treatments because of what happened to them during that operation. At the same time, 71 Israelis were killed by, by Palestinians, 66 soldiers, and five or six civilians, and one foreign national. That's what happened. The whole world looked the other way when that was happening. And Netanyahu, you know, I believe should be tried for crimes against humanity. This is my personal opinion, you know. But nobody said nothing. President Obama didn't say nothing. When this whole thing was going on, instead of saying, hey, hey, stop, what are you doing? You're killing civilians. You're targeting schools and hospitals. Instead of doing that, what, what did the United States government do? Which does not represent necessarily your, in my opinion, they sent even more military equipment to the, to the government of Israel. And more bullets. Nobody said a thing, you know. And I remember during that whole conflict, the only speech that President Obama made about the whole thing was one time when, the, when one of the Israeli soldiers got killed. Never mentioned women, never mentioned kids, never mentioned all of that tragedy that was taking place there. That's what's going on in the Middle East right now. So I believe that the government of Israel under this particular prime minister is going in the right direction where they just want to get the Palestinians out of that land. Why? Because the ultra-Orthodox Jewish people, you know, rabbis and whatnot, they believe this land is theirs. God gave it to them 3,000 years ago when he talked to Abraham. And they, they are not going to be stopped until they have their own way. What else is going on in the world right now? NATO is literally dismantling Arab countries one after another. Iraq, between 900 and 1 million civilian deaths since we went in to liberate them. Remember that? They were going to wait for us with open arms and sing songs and all going to become American citizens, you know. 1 million people died as a result of our intervention in there. Nobody's talking about that. That country doesn't exist anymore. Americans lost 4,500 soldiers. 32,000 is wounded officially. They say that over 100,000 is actually wounded unofficially, but the government doesn't want to admit it, you see. So what, why? Why is this happening? In Iraq today, today you have ISIS, you have Al-Qaeda. The country is split up into four or five different little regions. It's not the country anymore. It doesn't really exist. Libya, same thing. At least 30,000 people, <clears throat> at least 30,000 people were killed and 50,000 were wounded. Why? Because NATO and the NATO countries decided that they wanted to get Muammar Gaddafi out of power, so they sent in their operatives. All of a sudden, you had a revolution. 4,000 people to this day are still missing. Why? Because they wanted to get this guy out of power. The picture of Muammar Gaddafi, please, Jared. There you go. Now, none of these guys, this guy and Saddam Hussein and all the rest of them, none of them are angels. They are all, they are all devils in their own right. And they all did bad things to people in their own countries. And they all fought wars. And they are all, they all you know, I'm, I don't shed any tears for any one of them. But at the same time, you have now such a turmoil in the Middle East. Iraq doesn't exist anymore. Libya just about doesn't exist anymore. Syria, that toll now exceeds 210,000 people. That country has completely fallen apart. Yemen, 
you know, uh, so far almost 3,000 people have died over there. So a lot of these countries don't exist anymore. Why is this important? It is important because you are leaving a vacuum in there that ISIS is filling up. ISIS is this radical Muslim organization that they believe they want to get all of these countries under the banner of Islam flag, you see. And they're going to have Islam law, Sharia law. They are going to just go to war against Europe, against the United States, against everybody who does not, who does not believe in their faith. So they are completely insane group of people, and yet we are making it possible for them with our military actions to have huge pieces of land over there in all of those four or five countries that, where we have decided to change the governments. Where is this world going to? Do you see the, the, the real possibility of having another major World War III, a war in which you and I, our country, will be involved? I, you know, I did not even bother in this particular sermon to talk about the money that was spent on this, uh, on all of these operations. We just spent, I don't know if you saw this story in the news. This is, this is like yesterday in the news. We just, and this was in the congressional hearing, $500 million to train some rebels in Syria. We started out with 54 people, soldiers that we were going to train, and we ended up with five because the other ones deserted. So we spent 500 million American dollars to train five people who were going to oppose ISIS. Now, please, somebody tell me who is insane here. How, I mean, if you take 500 million dollars, what would $500 million do for the city of Detroit that has gone bankrupt? What would it do for the city of Denver? What would it do for any one of the American communities here where we have the lack of teachers and the lack of doctors? You go to Nebraska, you go to Wyoming, you can't find a local doctor anywhere. You've got to drive 150 miles to go to a clinic to talk to a doctor. And yet we are spending billions of dollars on these insane wars. And the only result that is going to happen uh, out of all of this is more war. One of the major results that we see right now is refugee crisis. Nine million Syrians have fled their homes since the war started. Have you seen that on TV? Nine million. Can you imagine nine million people? They just got up and they walked. They walked away from their country. Nine million people, Syrians fled their homes. And uh, I, I put a couple of pictures here. Look at those. Look at it. Jared, let's have that next picture of that city that's all destroyed. Keep going. He lost me because I was going so fast. Right there, you see. Now, if the city is destroyed and you don't have the running water, your toilet doesn't work, you can't go to the store, your kids can't go to the school, what are you going to do? You tell me. You're going to go to Germany, right? And you're going to walk 2,000 miles. And that's what they did. Nine million people on the move. Europe can't take them in. United States now, you know, we are talking about taking in 100,000 people into the United States. Not even the tip of the iceberg. Why did all of this happen? Who is in charge of all of this chaos? Who do you blame for all of this? The only one I can think of is Satan. You know what I mean? I, because you have people, you know, I believe that you have people, good people, Jewish people, they think this is our land, God gave this land to us. Arabs, they think this is our land, God gave this land to us. Americans, they think, well, we have to help Israelis because they're our friends, you know, and we'll do our best as best as we can. And everybody, you know, all of these good intentions, and we have this chaos on our hands. You know, and I believe that we are living in the time when Satan is uh, using this situation and causing these wars and these turmoils uh, because he wants to push for this one, 
wants to set up a situation in such a way that this greatest deception of them all will actually work. You see, if you have all the wars, if you have the famine, if you have, on top of this, if you have some natural disasters, if you have a situation in which the world is on the brink of collapse, then it's easy to pull off the deception. Here is Christ. Here is Jesus. He's speaking over here. Finally. Finally, Jesus is here. He's going to... Now, let me ask you something. How many... Uh, United States of America has, let's say, 350 million people. Let's just round it. 350 million people. How many of those people do you think actually know their Bible, have decent? How many? How many Seventh-day Adventists know their Bible, have decent? You see what I'm getting at? If somebody says, here is the Messiah, here is Jesus, here is Christ... And you don't know your Bible, you never read it, you never even opened it. The only sermon you saw was some guy on TV begging for money, you know. Then how are you going to know that that's really not Jesus? What if this Christ over here, you know, down the road in front of King Supers in the parking lot is healing people? People in the wheelchairs and blind people and whatnot. And he's healing them. And if you are an average person on the street who's never gone to church, who's never read their Bible, who knows more about Kim Kardashian than they know about Jesus Christ, you know, you tell me you're not going to be deceived? Sure, you're going to run over there if you have an ailment. So I believe that we are now in the position... When a whole world will be so easy to deceive. One million kids are refugees. One million children are refugees. We don't even talk about it, this in the United States, do we? What do we talk about? We're complaining about, oh, gas is cheap. I can go on a trip. You know, we're complaining about mundane, everyday things. And here you have one million kids sleeping on the streets. And Europe doesn't want them. The United States doesn't want them. They can't go back to their country. They'll be killed. Do you see how pretty soon we could have a situation where we need the external intervention into our affairs? Number five, you know, I just threw this one in because I'm going to mention it next week a little bit. The latest in 9-11. Uh, this is something that uh, is, you know, I brought, I brought it, I'm bringing it up because we are in the month of September. We just celebrated the anniversary of 9-11. I don't know, you can go to this website that I have put up there. And you can find out that 2,349 architects, engineers, signed a document stating that the official story about those buildings coming down is impossible. It just couldn't have happened that way. What happens if we find out, if it gets leaked, that something else happened than what we were told happened on 9-11? What happens if American people start losing the faith in their government? And a lot of them already have. Since 9-11, however, independent researchers around the world have assembled a large body of evidence that overwhelmingly refutes the notion that the airplane impacts and fires caused the destruction of the Twin Towers in WTC-7. This body of evidence, most of which FEMA and NIST omitted from their reports. That's happening in the world right now, too. Number six, how many of you watched the Republican debate? Every, every Republican nominee, I think there was 11 of them on the stage, except Donald Trump. And I know a lot of you don't like Donald Trump, but... The facts are the facts, you know, what can I say? Every single one promised more war. Did you realize that? Every single one. They said that they would continue fighting in Syria. They said that they would continue engaging Russia and Ukraine. Every single one wants more war. What do, what do, what do you think most American people want? Most American people want out of those countries. Survey after survey. 
They say that two, two out of a thousand are willing to continue all of these wars. Why? Because people are not stupid. People realize that this is costing a ton of money. And we have got paid taxes for that to support this. You know, we are supporting all of these wars and people here in this country can get a decent health care service. We are supporting all of these wars and our veterans, when they come back to this country, they can get compensated for their injuries that they have sustained fighting these wars. Do you realize that Vietnam veterans, the ones who fought in Vietnam and they were exposed to Agent Orange, just yesterday the government agency came out and said that, yes, we finally admit Agent Orange uh, does cause cancer. Most of those soldiers are dead by now. So you don't have to compensate them. You know, and this is what's going on. We're spending billions of dollars over there, and uh, we are not providing uh, for the most vulnerable down here. So that's why most Americans are saying we don't want any more wars. Yet people who are running for president on both sides, you know, Hillary Clinton, who is running on the, on the Democratic side and who is the most prominent over there, she's totally pro-war. You know, more war the better. General Electric, General Dynamics, uh, Boeing, all of these companies, they make billions of dollars when there is war. They don't make nearly as much when there is peace. So what do you think is going to happen? Num <laughs> we are broke already. <laughs> we are broke. We are literally broke. We are 19, almost $19 trillion in debt. Mathematically impo impossible to pay it back. We are broke. We're worse than broke. I mean, if you're 50 years old and you got another 15 years to work and you know exactly how much money you're going to make, if you all have a million dollars and you're making 30,000 a year, mathematically impossible for you to pay it back. It is mathematically impossible anymore for the United States government to pay back its, its what it owes. Because we know exactly how much money government takes in through taxes and we know exactly how much they are spending and we know exactly how much it is in the, in the hole. So at this point, in all, every mathematician, accountant, that's where they're sold is saying we can't pay it back anymore. So we are at this point just maintaining our debt. I don't know who said that, but we got into that a little bit. By the way, Pope is coming to America. You know that? That's a big one. Pope, Pope, Pope is coming to America on September 22. 2015, I'm going to give you a little rundown of what he's going to do here real quick. On, uh, on Wednesday, 23, number 23, he's meeting with President Obama. Pope, is coming to, Pope has met with presidents before, United States presidents. That, that has happened before. But the next day, you know what he's doing? He's addressing the joint session of Congress on Thursday the 24th. That has never happened in the history of the United States of America. Can I go back uh, with you to uh, the First Amendment? The, the, this clause not only forbids the government from establishing an official religion, but also prohibits government actions to unduly favor one religion over another. Catholic Church is the only one, is the only church in the world that is recognized by United States government as an actual state. And we have an ambassador to Vatican. And they have an ambassador to the United States. And they are religion. They're not the country. You know, they can say they're a country. They have a little, pit, a little uh, uh, several blocks of the city of Rome that's called Vatican, you know, and they call that the country. It's not the country. It's a religion. You know what our Constitution says? What our First Amendment clause says? The government... It, it will also prohibit government actions that unduly favor one religion over another. Well, to me, that sounds like the Catholic religion is favored a lot over all of the other religions in this country, in the United States of America. So the Pope is coming and he's addressing the joint session of Congress on, uh, on the 24th. This is all happening next week, you know. And as soon as, the, as soon as he's done with it, the next day, Friday the 25th, he's speaking at the 70th United Nations General Assembly. So he's meeting with the President of the United States, then he's speaking to the Joint Session of American Congress, 
And then he's address, addressing the general session of the United Nations. A religious leader. A religious leader. Why not Benny Hinn? <laughs> why the Pope? You know, why not Joe Austin? Why the Pope? You know, and I'll tell you why. Because the Pope is the head of the largest church in the world. One billion people call themselves Catholics. He has more power and more money than, uh, than any one of us can even imagine. And he's one person on this planet that the governments can use. The government of the United States, the government of Russia, the government of China, the government of Iran, that the United Nations can use to try and bring unity to this crazy, disunited, violent world of ours. He's one person that could appeal to everybody. President Obama can't appeal to everybody, not even in this country. Have the country hates him just like the head of the country hated President Bush before him. Hillary Clinton is not going to appeal to everybody. You know, Russian President Putin, he's not going to appeal to everybody. They don't have that pull. But the Pope... The Pope, he was sent by God, you know. I mean, the Pope says that he is the representative of Jesus Christ on this earth. And that he has the right to even edit the good book. Because he's the representative of Christ on this earth. So this man is going to... to be prominently welcomed into our country here next week. And he's going to make speeches. And he's going to push his influence on everybody. Is it because something could happen here in the next week or two? The last point that I want to share with you is the Shemitah year. Shemitah year, we talked about it last week a little bit during the sermon about that whole book, you know, that the guy wrote. Shemitah year just ended September 13. That was just a few days ago. Now, I put this on the screen because I want you to see what a crazy week we have ahead of us. And what, time, what, what crazy couple of weeks we have been living in here in the last few weeks. Shemitah year ended September 13. You know what the Shemitah year is, right? Is a, it is the cycle of seven years. Every seventh year, you are not supposed to, to, to uh, grow anything on your land. You're supposed to allow your land to rest from any kind of growth. That year just ended on September 13th, so that means that now you can grow again. Now you can work again. Now you can restart the whole process again. It's a new beginning. This is, this is the Jewish belief. September 14th, September 14, a lot of Jewish rabbis and a lot of people believe that September 14th is exactly 6,000 years since the creation and since Adam. In the Jewish year, it's 5,000 something, 400. Chris, do you know what this is? 54 something. But a lot of people are saying this is now the time when it's been exactly 6,000 years since Adam. What do many Christians believe about the age of this earth? 6,000 years, and then on the 7,000 year, what happened? The millennium, right? And the land and the earth rests from the sins and from the wicked people. So everybody is saying, 6,000 years is over. Give a day or two. Jesus is coming. Messiah is coming. September 15th, United Nations 70th anniversary. September 23, and this is why a lot of people are saying that we're going to have this uh, something big happened on September 23, 70th, 70th Jubilee of Israel. Every 50th year is a Jubilee year in the, Israel, in the Jewish tradition. And they, started, they started that tradition when Moses led them out of the land of Egypt three and a half thousand years ago. If you, go, if you divide three and a half thousand years by 50 years, you get 70. So this is the 70th Jubilee, a major date in the Jewish history. A lot of Jewish people believe this is now the time 
when God is going to restore Israel back to its original glory, to the time of David and the, to the time of Solomon, when the religion is going to be reestablished, when the temple is going to be reestablished, when the sacrifices are going to, be, to begin again, and when the Jewish nation is finally going to come back into its own right and power and might. September 23 is also the Day of Atonement. So you have all of these huge dates coming up here in the next few days. What's going to happen? And I, that's why I put that, that text on the screen. What's going to happen? The Bible tells us concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you my personal opinion. I don't think, this is my personal opinion, and next week you come back and let's see if <laughs> I was wrong. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to admit that I was wrong, you know. If I get hit by a meteor, you know, then we're not going to be here. But personally, I don't think that these, any of these dates, any of these jubilees, any of these sabbaticals, any of these things have anything to do with anything. Except one thing. I do believe that a few crazy people on both sides, Jewish side and the Muslim side, can basically push this whole planet into a major World War III. I do believe that they, they are capable of doing that. And if that happens then you could have a major catastrophe on this planet, unlike anything that we have ever seen in the last uh, couple of thousand years, probably since the time of Rome, you see. And if that happens, it's going to make this migration and this refugee situation that we have right now in Europe look like a picnic if something like that happens. So I do believe that there are minority people, crazy people, you know, uh, fanatics, both Christian and Muslim, and, and, uh, and Jewish, in Judaism, who could push all of the rest of us into this chaos that, uh, that nobody will be able to pull us out of. And then it does become very possible for such a figure as the Pope and as some of these big names that we have in the politics and government to come up and to say, hey, look, we need to do something about this. We're going to see what happens next, uh, this next week. Next Sabbath, we are going to conclude this series. We're going to conclude this series, and next Sabbath, I'm going to talk about the prophecy from the Seventh-day Adventist point of view. I'm going to talk about exactly what do we mean when we say millennium, exactly what do we mean when we talk about Armageddon, and we are going to talk about that. So if you have never heard that part, you need to be here for that. I hope that you will enjoy it. I hope that this was not too scary or crazy. I do also want to say this. I think I do need to say this. We as Christians need to pray for peace. Amen. We need to pray for peace for Israel, the nation of Israel, because I tell you, I think there are a lot of Jewish people in the land of Israel who don't want any wars, who just want to live their lives as normal people. And I think there is also a lot of people in Palestine, Palestinians, who are so sick and tired of all of these crazy people lobbing bombs into Israel and wanting to cause a major war. And I know there are millions of Americans right here in this country. I'm one of them who are so sick and tired of all of these fanatics wanting to bring about the Armageddon and the destruction of this planet so that Jesus would come. You know what? If the only way Jesus is going to come is, is, is if millions of people have to die, then you know what? I don't want him coming. I'm serious. That's not the God we talk about. That's not the God we serve. That's not the God that says, I'm going to come if you all kill each other. I think we as Christians need to pray for peace for the whole world. And I think we need to preach the gospel. And the gospel is simple. And I'm going to leave you with that here right now today. If you, never, if you don't know where gospel is, and if you have to share the gospel with somebody ever in the future, it's very simple. I'm going to give it to you right now so you can remember it for the rest of your lives. 
You, all you have to remember is this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's all you need to remember. You don't even need to remember the verse because it's right there in the first and second verses. If you just remember 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's your key to gospel. If you don't know anything about the Bible, if you have never given a Bible study, if you have never presented, if you have never led anybody to Jesus Christ, all you need to do is remember 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at what it says. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you what? The gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Kephas and then by the, tw by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. And that's what we need to preach to this world. That we need salvation. We need peace. We don't need war. We don't need countries fighting each other and killing each other and bombs and all of that stuff. We need gospel. We need Jesus. Jesus came to die for the people. Jesus didn't come to die so that Israel can have the big, powerful country. Jesus didn't come to die so that Palestinians could have a big, powerful country. Jesus didn't come to die so that America can be this big, powerful. Jesus said very clearly, my kingdom is not of this world. He came to die for your sins. I want to leave you with that. God bless you. Hope you come back next week and we finish this uh, series. Amen. If you could all please stand.
Before we have our closing prayer, I would just like to remind you that we have our thank offering and our tithe offering boxes at the near the X's. I think there's one here and then one outside. I'm not quite sure, but there is one by the door. Um, I think that was all I was supposed to remind you. Have a very good week, and let's bow our heads for um, our closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another wonderful Sabbath day that we get to be here with you and learn a little bit more about what's going on around the world and um, uh, help us remember to pray for peace and to pray for just um, the many lives that are being affected by the war. Um, I also like to pray that um, you keep us safe and we're very thankful that we have everything that we need here in our country. Um, I pray for the many other people who don't have those things. Um, thank you for everything. You hear me pray. Amen.